Hello everyone, I'm Guillermo from Fortivo Music Channel and welcome to Music Talks, our video podcast series. These are relatively short interviews with prominent people from all walks of life who don't work in the music industry but who are in many ways impacted by music. Today we're going to take a slight departure from our typical interview. For most of our guests, these interviews are the first time they've been asked about their musical interests and the first time they've had a chance to speak about their musical interests. However, David Meerman Scott is an exception because he's been extremely public about his lifelong passion for music, and he's incorporated it into his life as a best-selling author and a widely acclaimed public speaker. David has written 12 books, including The New Rules of Marketing and PR and Fanocracy, a book that is extremely relevant to our music topic and one that he co-wrote with his daughter, Reiko. We'll include all of his details in the description below, but we also managed to weave some of his work into our conversation. I'm sure you'll enjoy this wide-ranging talk, including unique perspectives on Bob Marley, The Grateful Dead, and how to incorporate music into your professional life. So let's get started. Here's my conversation with David Meerman Scott. David Meerman Scott, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to share this time with you. It's great to be here to talk about my favorite topic. Yeah, you know, it's funny because on this podcast series, usually we get people coming in to talk about music and it's something they usually don't get to talk about. Uh, but you're an, an exception to that case because you've been very public about your love of music and have written about it and have spoken about it. So it's, yeah. it's great to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, I know I do that on purpose because I want to make it a part of my life and I want to make it a part of my my business life as well as as my personal life. Um, and for me, running my own thing, it you kind of like never really know which one I'm doing. But but yeah, it's super important to me uh, and has been for my basically my entire life. Well, so that's a great place to start. Why don't we start there? Uh, usually I ask people what uh, you know, what started their interest in music. And for some people like you, it seems like it's a lifelong uh, passion. Do, do you have early memories of when you first got exposed to music? Yeah, I do. Uh, I remember when I was a little kid, my dad had a, a quite a good stereo for the time. And uh, he would listen to Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass, which I really liked. Um, and then um, uh, I tried to play music, but never really took took to it. But where things really took off was when I was a teenager, starting at age 14 listening to music, but 15 is when it really kicked in because I started to go to live concerts. And I don't know what was in my parents' mind when they when they allowed us, my friends and I, to go to New York City. We lived I lived in Connecticut and it was a one hour train ride to New York City to Grand Central Station. And then we would walk from there to Madison Square Garden, to the Palladium, to the Ritz, to other um, music venues. We were teenagers. We were 15, 16, 17 years old in high school. And I think I had seen well over 100 concerts by the time I graduated from high school. I saw Led Zeppelin at Madison Square Garden in 1977. Um, I saw um, the Ramones played my high school. Um, I saw the Talking Heads at Forest Hill Tennis Stadium. Um, I saw the Clash. I mean, amazing bands um, that at the time, you know, we would just go and do our thing. And now when I talk about it, people like you saw Led Zeppelin at Madison Square Garden tell me, that, wow, that's crazy. Um, I, to give you context, I mean, you know this, I'm 61 years old. Um, so starting at age 15, going to see concerts, that would have been 1975. Um, so had an opportunity to see some some early great bands, um, Muddy Waters, um, and we could go on with the list, but but that's how I really got my start, is that opportunity with, there were a, a core group of three of us and sometimes other hangers on uh, would just road trip into New York at least once a month, sometimes two or three times a month. What do you think, especially early on, because I know you've you've um, you've spent your entire life going to live shows, but early on when you first started as a teenager, what do you think it was about the live shows that really grabbed you? Was it going with your three friends and doing these adventurous things? Was it the crowd? Was it the music? Was it the acts? Like, what was it? I think it was all of the above. And I'm going to get really nerdy on you right now. Um, I hope you don't mind, but I um, I actually dug in deep into this topic um, as part of a book I wrote called Fanocracy. I know you're aware of it. 
um, where I wanted to look at why do we become fans of something? And why in the world did I become such a massive fan of live music? Why in the world did my daughter, um, Reiko, become such a massive fan of Harry Potter? And she and I wrote this book, Fanocracy, together. It's a, and we study this idea of fandom. And it turns out that when we're teenagers, basically sort of in the going through puberty, trying to figure out your own way in the world kind of time frame in our lifespan, um, there's usually a coming of age ceremony. And there's been a coming of age ceremony throughout most of human history, whether that's something like a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah in the Jewish tradition, um, whether it's something like communion in the um, religious tradition of, um, of some Christian uh, religions. In my case, I wasn't religious. I didn't have that kind of coming of age ceremony. So for me, the coming of age was really the idea that my parents allowed us at, at a young, as young, allowed me as a young teenager to go into New York City. And this is how I, how my transition to adulthood is essentially, um, which is what a coming of age ceremony is. And I dug in so deep into this um, and, um, you know, you'll get a kick out of this, went to Panama and spoke with uh, a number of the, um, the people in the village of Kangandi to understand the Panamanian um, coming of age ceremonies uh, and how they do it. And it basically is a cultural thing. And for me, the cultural thing was doing that. And we remember throughout our entire lives, those formative things that happen in our life. Now I'm analyzing this like five decades later, but the basic idea of why this became so important to me is that that idea of taking the train to New York City with a bunch of 15 year olds, 15 year olds are kids, <laughs> with a, as kids, taking the train in the big bad city, we'd go to um, this place we knew that would serve us, even though we were way underage, drank beer, went to the show, we were the youngest people by far at these shows. Um, um, and then, you know, walk back and we'd get home at two, three, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. It was, again, it was, I can't believe my parents let me do that. So that's the nerdy kind of neuroscience, um, cul um, cultural kind of reason for it. And I think that actually is pretty true because I've spoken with a number of people around other things, whether it's baseball or whatever it might be that, that they've had that lifelong love because they had, they developed the love when they were going through puberty, they were going through that coming of age ceremony age. And in our culture, we don't really have coming of age so much anymore um, for most people. So we do it ourselves, figure it out for ourselves. Yeah, it's funny that was that way nerdier than you would expect my answer to be. <laughs> no, that was exactly as nerdy as I would expect it to be. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny uh, mentioning, you know, going through puberty and 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 uh, doing the coming of age and and seeing live music. I still remember my exposure to music started well before that because I took classical piano as, as a kid. Yeah, but I, mean, as I did too, but that didn't stick. It, right. For me, for me, playing music, I did piano, I did um, trumpet. Um, it that didn't stick in the way that going to live music shows did. Exactly, because. Because what happened with me when I turned, I went through puberty when I was 11, like in sixth grade in middle school. And I still remember to this day in sixth grade, they one day they allowed a high school band uh, or a high school rock band, right? Now I'm realizing those kids were probably 15 or 16. But to me at the time, they seemed like adults. And yeah. they allowed them to come in and play four songs during our lunch Wow! in our quad. Cool. And I still remember, I, I remember two of the songs. One was Boys, and, Boys Are Back in Town by Thin Lizzy and the yeah, other was Breakdown yeah. by Tom Petty. And nice. I still can visualize right now the rhythm guitarist out on the end. Uh, and, and I thought, oh, that's cool. That's what I want to do. And after that, I always wanted to go see live shows, you know, nice. or, or ideally be on stage. But I didn't get a chance to do that as much. But I did get a chance to do some live shows. But I can totally see what you're saying about the, you know, the coming of age uh, uh, activity and how that tends to stick for the rest of your life. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's breaking away from parents. It's, you know, doing something on your own. It's doing something a little bit dangerous. And it's all those things combined. Super cool. And actually, for me, it was funny because at the time in middle school, so I'm I'm like five years younger than you. Um, my two favorite groups were the Eagles and ACDC. Nice. And so I thought, I want to go see them. I want to go see them. No way my parents were going to let me go. No way my parents uh, were going to let me go. Finally, when I graduated middle school in 1980, they said, okay, you can go. And if you remember, 1980 is when Bon Scott died. So ACDC didn't play for a while until Back in yeah. Black came out. And that's also the same year that the Eagles broke up uh, for, for 12 bummer. years, or 14 years. So I'm like, ah, oh, I didn't get to go see them until much later, but I did right. get to go see some live shows. So that was good. Cool. Um, well, why don't we stay on that topic for a bit? Uh, you mentioned uh, you, that you've seen a lot of live shows. You're probably the one person I know who's seen more live shows than anybody else. And uh, you keep track of them, right? Like how many shows have I, you been to? I, I do. I'm super um, obsessive about list keeping, not only with live music, but other things as well. Like how many countries I've been to, 107 at this point. Um, so with live music, uh, in the early days, I kept all my ticket stubs and I had them in a bo in a wooden box. So I'd get back from a show um, and usually it said the name, still had the name on the ticket stub, but sometimes if they tore it in a way um, that you couldn't read the name, I would jot it down in a pencil. And those all went into a, a wooden box. And then um, uh, when I was in my mid 20s, um, Microsoft Excel um, burst onto the scene. So I thought, oh, shoot, I should put all my shows into a spreadsheet, which I did. And then I'm, I'm glad I did both of those things, because then, of course, with Ticketmaster and electronic ticketing and a bunch of other things that are happening, printouts and whatnot, um, tickets um, are way less obvious. And, you know, you don't have most shows now you don't have a paper ticket anymore so everything for me goes into the spreadsheet and i'm well over 900 i forget the exact number i should have looked it up before we started talking it's around 930 shows that i've seen in my lifetime um, and um, of those the most that i've seen of any one band uh, is grateful dead and i'm at um, i believe it's 91 shows so far so 10 per roughly 10 percent of my going to shows has been either the Grateful Dead when Jerry Garcia was still alive, or um, I also include in that number 91 any of the bands that followed Jerry's death, where there was an original member who was in the band. So that includes, for example, um, these days, Dead in Company, which is uh, John Mayer taking on the Jerry Garcia role. Nice. And and I I want to get back in a minute to to the Grateful Dead, because I know you've done a lot of uh, thinking about that and a lot of writing about that and speaking about that. Uh, but before we leave the live show topic, I, I was curious, do you find that there are bands that are better recording artists, better songwriters and some that are better performers? Um, like I, I've, I've always been amazed that there's some bands that as musicians, they may not be that great, like when you listen to them play, yeah. but their shows are just amazing. Uh, I do. I do. There's there's bands that focus on performance. There's bands that focus more on albums. Um, and as well, there's bands that focus on perfecting performance such that every show is either identical or nearly identical. Um, there's no room for improvisation. So um, while I do love a good unbelievably well rehearsed um you know every song is the same kind of show um i can really only go to a show like that once because e even the 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 in between song pattern in some with some bands is the same they tell the same dumb jokes in between two the the same two songs every night no matter where it is and I can see that once and enjoy it. I can't see it again. However, there's a number of bands like the Grateful Dead, jam bands and, and other bands that the set list changes up from night to night or the way they perform each song changes up from night to night. And to me, that's super interesting because um, uh, I can go to a show and it's always different, even if I go to the same band multiple times. Um, my latest obsession, which I, um, I've dug into just this year, 2022, has been uh, Goose. And they're, uh, they're one of my current favorite bands. 
Um, I've managed to see them so far twice, uh, and I'm going to see them again. I already have tickets for um, for a couple months from now. Um, but they're also they're also in the jam band tradition, although they're more of a trance based jam band as opposed to the Grateful Dead. That's more of a uh, Grateful Dead, I would say, is country slash bluegrass um, kind of jam band. Um, and and, I, and I'm, I'm loving Goose. It's uh, super cool. They've become very popular just in the last year. And it's, um, you know, they're still playing clubs, but I, I, I'm going to guess that they're probably going to graduate up to bigger venues soon. So it's nice to see them in the in the smaller ones. And, you know, getting back to the spreadsheet, when I tell people I'm such a nerd, <laughs> with my grateful with my spreadsheet listing 930 shows people say what's your favorite and i don't have a favorite show but i do have a most epic show and the most epic show and you you and i have shared this is i'm the only person known to have taken photographs at bob marley's last concert and this is a photograph um, from Bob Marley's last concert. It was September 23rd, 1980 at the Stanley Theater in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I was um, a 19 year old college student going to Kenyon College in Ohio. And Pittsburgh was four hours away. And um, fortunately, I gravitated to the music fans at, at college too, because I had been such a uh, going to so many shows as, as a high school student and found some people who wanted to go with me. So four of us got into a car, we road tripped from Ohio to Pittsburgh, we didn't have tickets yet. Um, and I, for whatever reason, I don't know why I did this. I asked the yearbook photographer if I he's a friend of mine, if I could borrow his camera. And I've never taken a camera to a show before or since, although, of course, I've got my iPhone now, but never before since that I take a camera to a show. Uh, and I took it to this Bob Marley show and it was a big ass lens on this camera. And we road tripped four hours to Pittsburgh and got suitably prepared as one does before they're going to see a, a Bob Marley show. And uh, we managed to get four tickets. Um, they were up in the first balcony. Uh, and then because I had this big camera, I just walked right downstairs and they thought I was a professional photographer because of the of the size of this professional camera I had. And I went right down front, took some amazing photographs of the show. And um, a half dozen of them were in focus. <laughs> it wasn't my camera and I was, um, uh, you know, prepared for a Bob Marley concert. So um, it was surprising that I was able to focus even a half dozen of them. But since then, because um, this was his last show, the only show he performed where he knew he was dying of cancer. Uh, and um, and these photographs have become incredibly historic. There's a very, very large uh, format version of that um, photograph. Um, it's as big, it's actually bigger than this, um, which is in the Stanley Theater in Pittsburgh, um, in the lobby. Um, there's a photograph in the Bob Marley the Museum in uh, Kingston, Jamaica. Um, there's one of these photographs in the uh, Pittsburgh um, Heinz Museum, because it turns out this show um, is crazy historic. And I spoke with the people who run the, the, the Stanley Theater in Pittsburgh. Um, it's been around for more than 100 years. And many, 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 many famous um, acts have been there for starting with vaudeville. Um, and this show, Bob Marley, September 23rd, 1980, is their most famous show. I am the only one to have taken photographs. So you never know if you're going to shows all the time. You never know when you might um, have an opportunity to experience history. Yeah, and I imagine that camera you took was a film camera, not a digital camera. Uh, it was film. Yeah, very much film. Um, way, way, way before digital, because that was 40, what, two years ago? Um, so yeah, uh, very much film. And I actually shot slides, which um, the photographer whose camera I borrowed suggested that I shoot slides. Um, and then uh, had had the shots, went, went to a really high-end photography studio to have the slides turn into digital negatives. Uh, huge resolution digital ne negatives that then I used to create the prints that um, I've sent out to these various places. These photographs that I took were also 
um, uh, five minutes in the Marley documentary that was re that was put out a couple of years ago because they had no other visual record of that show except for me. Nice. You know, I, I know that um, about 10 years ago or so, you wrote a blog post about this, uh, this I experience. Did. And uh, one of the paragraphs that stood out for me on, in, in that blog post was, uh, you mentioned that the first time you heard Bob Marley was when you were in your friend's dorm room and he I started was, blasting yeah. it and it just blew you away right from the beginning. Do you remember what it was about that Bob Marley tune that came on that just grabbed you right from the beginning? Uh, uh, it, was, it was Ned Lee, my good friend. Um, and Ned was playing this music. I'd never heard radio before ever. Um, and I was like, wow, what's this? It's, it's, it's rocky. It's different. It's kind of jam bandy. It's like, wow, it's super great. And it was different. Again, we've talked about this. It was just different. I loved that it was something I hadn't heard before and I needed to hear more of it. Um, so um, I, I kind of dove into reggae at that point. And then it was very soon after that, that the show came up, the Bob Marley show came up. So uh, I went in, I went to see that. And um, so about four or five months ago, um, Chris Blackwell published his biography and Chris Blackwell, founder of Island Records. And um, he's the one who signed Bob Marley, he also signed U2 and, and a bunch of other bands. And when he was describing Bob Marley and he, and he discovered him in Jamaica and it was very Jamaican style reggae, when he signed him, he said, let's work together to add some rock guitarists and some other rock and roll elements to your music and see if we can make it uh, more attractive to an international audience of people like me, uh, a young rock and roll fans, which is exactly what happened. And uh, a, a postscript to that part of the story is two weeks ago, I was actually at Chris Blackwell's resort in Jamaica. It's called GoldenEye. It was the place where Ian Fleming wrote the James Bond films. Uh, so sorry, James Bond books. And I brought Chris Blackwell, who was found it found Bob Marley, signed Bob Marley, and managed um, Bob Marley's recording career for his entire life. Um, I brought him a copy of that photo as well. I was super excited to receive that. So um, yeah, I think that was it. It was this idea of taking island music and adding that rock and roll element that just grabbed me yeah i think that's one of the i think drivers behind us doing this podcast series and other uh efforts like this to help music fans discover new music because yeah like e even for me i still remember the first time i heard eddie van halen play eruption I'd mm. never heard the guitar played. Like, a lot of people had never heard the guitar played like that before. And it's amazing how uh, transformative those kinds of first impressions can really be. Right. No, I agree with that 100%. And um, yeah, I saw Van Halen way back in the day. I, I don't have the spreadsheet in front of me. I could tell you the exact date, but um, uh, uh, probably late 70s. Um, and yes, I agree. Well, I, I want to go back a little bit. I, I, I took you off track when you were talking a little bit about the Grateful Dead yeah. uh, earlier, but I wanted to get back to it because I know, uh, number one, obviously you're a big fan and, and it's also been a big influence on, on your life, but uh, you've also done a great job of incorporating music in your professional life. And you've written a lot of books on marketing and sales, and you've also managed to incorporate the Grateful Dead into that. So I, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, of course. So I did um, write um, a, a book uh, called Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead. Um, and uh, I worked on that book together with Brian Halligan. Brian is the um, co-founder and currently chairman of HubSpot, as well as Bill Walton. And Bill, of course, is uh, the NBA Basketball Hall of Famer. Um, and Bill is also the world's largest deadhead, um, not only because he's seven feet tall, I'm six one, and I look like a midget next to Bill Walton. This was backstage at um, a, the Skull and Roses Festival in Ventura, California, and um, um, Bill has become a friend. And Bill not only 
is the largest deadhead because he's seven feet tall. He's also the largest deadhead because he's seen the Grateful Dead or the bands that followed the Grateful Dead with the original members 850 times, which is... Does, um, does he have a spreadsheet to prove it? He doesn't, but he keeps track of the numbers. Um, so that's kind of nutty. And, um, and yeah, the Grateful Dead has been important. I've, I've written 13 books. I've managed to slip references to the Grateful Dead in every single one of them. And, um, and at, in nearly every one of my uh, speeches around the world, I've delivered presentations in over 40 countries. Um, I, I, I also have at least one riff where I talk about um, how the Grateful Dead has done great marketing and what marketers can learn from the Grateful Dead. Um, and then I've also worked together with a bunch of, with several of my friends, there's about, about four or five of us who have together acquired instruments that were originally used by members of the Grateful Dead. And we then um, allow those instruments to be played by Grateful Dead cover bands. Now you're not gonna, you may not believe this, but there are well over a hundred Grateful Dead cover bands um, active. I mean, I'm talking active in the United States. There's even a website, GratefulDeadTributeBands.com that you can go and check out and see any night of the week. Like if I happen to be in a city and I'm looking for something to do, I'll, I'll see if there's a Grateful Dead cover band that night. And sometimes I'll go check them out. But what we do um, with these instruments is allow people to play them. Now, imagine you're a member of a Grateful Dead band and you've played the Jerry Garcia role or you've played the Bob Weir role for 10 or 20 or even 30 years. And all of a sudden, somebody's offering you the opportunity to play one of the actual instruments that the members of the band had played back in the day. And that's what we do. And um, it's very, very similar to the way that that classical music, um, when somebody buys a Stradivarius um, violin, um, it's almost never the person who plays um, the violin on Carnegie Hall or the other big stages. Um, a wealthy person will buy the violin uh, as an investment or because they love the object, and then they'll allow great violinists to play it. And, um, and those two people, the owner and the musician are very different. So we, uh, my friends and I have applied that idea to Grateful Dead instruments. So um, for example, Brian Halligan um, owns Jerry Garcia's Wolf guitar. And that's John Mayer who's um, holding the guitar and I'm with Brian Halligan who's in the middle. And, um, and this was at City Field in New York City. And um, Wolf was played by John Mayer at Dead & Company in front of 50,000 people and, and another several hundred thousand people live streaming. Uh, and um, it was an amazing experience for him. This is backstage in between the two sets um, for him to have a chance to play the instrument that was probably the most famous of Jerry Garcia's um, for John to play that. And this is a guitar called No Fun which Bob Weir played for a hundred shows between 1985 and 1987. And I own this guitar and um, it's a super fun instrument. Um, here's Bob Weir and Jerry Garcia. Uh, Bob's playing the no fun guitar. Um, and in fact, even um, Bob Dylan had a, had a chance to play it once. Um, and so the musicians love the fact that um, me and my friends have curated um, these instruments so that they're not just on somebody's wall at home. Um, I see a guitar behind you, um, but they're actually out there and being um, given the opportunity uh, to be played. Um, so um, I, I love owning the No Fun guitar. It's, it's, even, it's got its own Instagram, which is No Fun Live um, uh, on, an, on Instagram, where I share um, historic photos of the instrument from the 1980s being played as well as contemporary photos of the bands that are playing them today, playing that instrument today. Uh, this may be a weird question to ask a big Grateful Dead fan, but to the extent that um, a big part of this podcast series is trying to introduce music fans to music that's new to them, uh, let's assume that I've never heard of the Grateful Dead or I've never listened to the Grateful Dead, mm -hmm. but I was willing to listen to one Grateful Dead song because you're such a big fan. Is there a particular song you'd recommend that I, that I listen to? 
Um, that's a tough one. Uh, again, because one of the great things about the Grateful Dead is that they've done um, uh, their jam band and they do every song differently night, night, night after night. They, um, they probably have had a hundred or 150 songs in their repertoire any night, but they would only play say 15 or 20 songs in a given night. So you never know what you're going to hear. So I would have a, I have a couple suggestions. One is, um, their most famous song and the only one to break the top 10 is a song called Touch of Grey. Uh, so it's probably worth listening to Touch of Grey if you wanted to check out just one song uh, because it did become popular. Um, they also did a, a, a ton of covers. Um, they've covered bands like Pink Floyd and the Rolling Stones um, and lots of Bob Dylan covers and um, Beatles covers and uh, many, many, many um, covers. So you can go to um, Google and just type in what, you know, what songs of the Grateful Dead covered. Take a look at that list. And then um, the Grateful Dead, this is part of the marketing lessons from the Grateful Dead, are, are, are among the only band in history that allows fans to record their concerts. So unlike practically every other band of the era, uh, who said, no, 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 no recording allowed. The Grateful Dead said, sure, why not? So chances are you'll be able to find um, on YouTube or archive.org or some other place um, any um, song that they've, that they've played. And therefore, let's say you're a Beatles fan and you want to hear um, the Grateful Dead's take on a Beatles song or you're a Rolling Stones fan. You want to see the listen to the Grateful Dead's take on a Rolling Stones song, or you're um, a traditional blues fan and you want to hear the Grateful Dead's take on a Muddy Waters song, that might be a way to check out the Grateful Dead is hear a song you already love, but a different version of it, a Grateful Dead version of it. It's funny that you mentioned that because that is my personal favorite way of discovering new artists is I take songs that I already know and then I'll do exactly what you said, either a Google search or a YouTube search for yeah. covers of that song. And just to see how other artists interpret that same song. Some of them will try doing it note for note, exactly the same, yeah, to right. pay tribute to it. And some of them, it's almost unrecognizable. You know, you'll take a fast song, a fast like metal song, and all of a sudden it comes out as an acoustic ballad or the inverse. Uh, and it's just interesting how people interpret those, but it's a great way of discovering new artists. I, I agree, and it, and it is, and and I've I've gotten to the point where I love some of the Grateful Dead versions of songs even better than I love the traditional ver you know the original versions, and I'll give you an example of that. So, um, uh, Grateful Dead, going back to a long time ago, has tr has done a cover of Dear Mr. Fantasy, a traffic song, and so um, they've tradition kept that tradition going even post Jerry Garcia. So um, last year I went to, I think I went to six Dead & Company shows last year. And they, I went to two shows at um, Folsom Field in Boulder, Colorado, and I actually have tickets for th for all three nights in, in Boulder this coming summer. But they played um, Dear Mr. Fantasy, great version of it. And then they segued from there into Hey Jude by the Beatles. And it was a great one-two punch cover and just so good. It was a song that I already knew from Traffic. I'd already heard at other shows. But it's just like, wow, how cool is it to, to hear that? So, so yeah, again, that would be my recommendation to ease into the Grateful Dead is to, to listen to a cover of something you already know. Yeah, and sometimes the inverse is true too. Like just uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, I, I was listening, something came on, what song was it? Oh, Manfred Mann's uh, Blinded, uh, Blinded by the Light. Yeah, oh yeah. Light, which was a number one song, but it was originally by Springsteen. Yes. So I actually went and listened to the original for the first time, even like two weeks ago. And I'm like, oh, wait a sec. I like the original much better than the uh, <laughs> nice than the cover. Uh, so I, I did want to go back a little bit. I know, um, you know, a lot of our guests have taken ways of have found ways of incorporating music into their own lives. You obviously have taken it to to huge extreme, uh, especially because besides writing uh, best selling books, you're also a public speaker. Uh 
And I believe you've incorporated a lot of your love of music, especially live music, into your own work in that arena. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So um, we already talked about how I, I write about music and marking lessons from the Grateful Dead or the idea of fandom in my book, Fanocracy. Um, I've written a, a whole bunch of blog posts that are related to music, but I'm also, um, I speak all over the world and I treat my public speaking um, as as performance art and we we talked earlier about the fact that playing music never really took with me and i wasn't very good at it and i didn't really it didn't feel natural to me i just didn't really like it very much but i love speaking on a stage and so i've um i've recognized that um when you're in front of an audience whether you're a musician or a dancer um, or a public speaker like I am, um, or a singer, or whatever it might be, you're, you're, you're performing, an actor, you're performing. And so I incorporate in my talks a number of things that I've learned by watching so many bands um, and, and how they interact. So um, I just took a, uh, I have a photo here of me on a on a pretty big stage. I think there's about, I don't know, 2000 people in this particular audience. And um, I brought members of the audience up onto state onto the stage, and I'm um, shooting a selfie with them. Um, and so the idea of of how can you create something interesting like that? Um, becomes part of my performance art. The other thing that I noticed is that in some cases, um, some of the musicians might go into the audience. Um, you know, they've got a microphone, they go in, or they've got a guitar, they go into the audience. And I go into the audience when I'm speaking. Um, and it just changes up the dynamic. Um, in, in my speeches, I use music. Um, I've got some of my slides have music elements in them and i play the music and sometimes i talk about what i'm playing and sometimes i'm talking over the top of the music um, uh, as a way to um, have the audience hear music during the talk so it's not just my voice dron droning on and then i also use performance elements like um you know sometimes when i'm at a show i'll see one of the musicians will stand on to stand up on one of the um, uh, the speakers, for example, um, or do something like run across the stage. Mick Jagger is great for that kind of thing. You know, he's always running, always active. So very often in my talks, I'll run across the stage to make a point, literally run across the stage to make a point. Um, in some of my talks, although most of the time the speakers are not on the stage, like they are in a rock show, but sometimes they are, and particularly the really big events where um, where there's thousands of people in the audience. If there is a speaker, I'll make a point of figuring out a point in my program where I can get onto the top of the speaker and say something and then jump off. And nobody does this in my world. Nobody does this. And I'm giving away some of my trade secrets here, but when, when somebody, I finish my talk, and people, you know, will come up and, talk, and and see me either right after the talk or at a break or at the cocktail reception afterwards or whatever. And by far the most um, most commented term is they say high energy. I have high energy. Um, I'm actually kind of a laid back guy, but on a stage because I incorporate these techniques that I learned at rock shows by watching rock stars. People believe I've got high energy, you know, running across the stage, jumping on the speaker, going into the audience. Um, I actually will start many, many speeches from the back of the audience. People will say, and please welcome David Meerman Scott. The voice of God is what it's called. Please welcome David Meerman Scott. And I will run down the aisle um, from the back of the audience, run, run down the aisle and then um, leap onto the stage if it's the right size or if there's stairs, I'll take them two at a time to get up to the, to the stage. And then, um, and people like, you know, at first they're like, what the hell is this guy doing? But then the whole point is that even before I open my mouth, I've expressed that I'm high energy. Um, so those things work for me. I enjoy them. I'm not a rock star because I don't play music, but 
Um, I, I still can do rock star like things with my work um, as a public speaker. Yeah, it's funny that the way you're talking about kind of treating your speaking as a performance or as performance art. Uh, I've moderated a lot of panels, done a lot of speaking, but when I moderate panels, I always tell the panelists beforehand, remember, you're not here to pitch, you're not here to do anything, yeah. you're here to entertain the audience. And um, one of the things that I did once, I was always uncomfortable with the dynamic on stage where no matter how you seat everybody with the panel and the moderator, uh, and no matter how much you tell the panelists, look, if I ask you a question, rank a comment, don't look at me, look at the audience. Yeah. But it's unnatural. It's an uh, it's an unnatural human interact uh, dynamic to not look at the person who you're talking to. Right. So once I took the microphone and I just went into the audience, kind of like Phil Donahue or something, you know, and just nice. kind of, I asked my questions or did everything from the audience. So that way they were forced to look at the audience. How did that work? It worked, it worked really well. well. Yeah. I nice. got a lot of positive comments afterwards. It, it, I didn't I didn't warn the panelists, though. So it kind of threw them off a little bit, but uh, nice. but no, that worked. Um, re related to that, actually, I, I did want to uh, ask you one other thing because uh, I know you also wrote a blog post about Mick Jagger, uh, and and kind of lessons learned from his performance on how he approaches things that you take into your own life as well. Um, and one of the things that resonated with me was you were talking about how clear it was that Mick Jagger rehearses everything, you know, beforehand, and it reminded me of two things. One is also in performance art, but Chris Rock as a as a stand-up comic who said, you know, comics have to stand-up comics have to rehearse everything down to like where they stand on the stage, their hand oh, mannerisms, yeah. everything. Yeah. And um, and also Steve Jobs once said about business presentations, you know, when you're giving PowerPoint presentations or whatever, you know, you've got to rehearse, 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 so that when you actually give it, it comes off naturally. Exactly right. Yeah. I I, I have found the same thing to be true, is that um if you rehearse like crazy um, and you know where you're going to be standing, what you're going to be doing with your hands, where you're going to be looking, um, you know the punchline of your joke two, three slides before you even set up the joke. Those kinds of things make the performance better, but, but also they make it feel like you're winging it. It make it feel to the audience like you're just kind of making it up on the spot. It's super interesting that way. And with Jagger too, you know, it's obviously amazingly well rehearsed, but the way you see him on stage, he feels like he's just naturally doing this. Um, and so I found that to be very, very important for what I do as well is, is rehearse, 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 rehearse. And I think here's how I think about that. I think about it like pool, bill, billiards. Do you play pool? Yes. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you do play pool, you know that um, at first, what you're trying to do is hit the cue ball and sink another ball. And that's all you're focused on. Maybe for the first 200 times you play, that's what you're focused on. But when you start to get good at pool, what you're focused on is you already know you're going to sink that ball. But what you're focused on is setting up the cue ball for your next shot so that you have an easy sink on the next shot. And I've never quite gotten that good. I've kind of sort of have a, a few times in my life gotten reasonably close to that good, but I, I never really got great at lining up the cue ball. I look at public speaking and the what I do is as very similar to that. When I'm on a slide, talking to a slide, talk, telling a story, um, um, giving a bit of data, whatever I'm doing on the stage at that moment, I'm actually setting up the next couple of seconds. Uh, if I'm um, delivering a punchline to a joke, I've already set that up uh, 30 seconds or 45 seconds earlier so that I know that I'm going to sink that next ball because I've set up my cue ball. I know that I'm going to land the next joke because I set it up properly 30 seconds earlier. And that's all from rehearsal. You cannot wing that. It is rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, here's what I want to do. I want to start wrapping this up with um, 
with a homework assignment that I usually give our guests, which yeah. you, you decided you did not want to do. And I thought your reasons for not doing it were extremely relevant to what we talk about on this podcast series. Uh, so usually I ask guests to pick 10 songs, create a 10 song playlist that they would want to take with them if they were on a deserted island or whatever. And um, and you didn't want to do that. And I thought it'd be great if you shared your reasons why you don't want to do that, because I think it's a perfect way to end this conversation. Yeah, sure. So I get bored easily. Uh, I get bored easily with a lot of different things, but I get bored easily with music. And um, I have go-to bands, Grateful Dead and some others, um, but I never really listen to the same thing all the time. And so for me to choose 10 songs is kind of makes me miserable. Um, and if you were to ask me that question today, I might share with you 10 songs that are interesting to me today. But if you ask me the same question three weeks from now, you'd probably get different songs because I'm focused on some different things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't have favorites in that way. And I feel like if I were on a desert island with 10 songs, I would go insane because after listening to them a few times, I would know them so well that I just, it would, it would not, it would not be good. So um, yeah, that's, that's a question. It was really difficult for me to answer. So I did the lazy man approach and I said, I'm not going to answer it. And it sounds like you wouldn't just rotate through 10 different songs. You're also constantly discovering new songs and, and new I'm artists, constantly right? discovering new bands um, constantly, you know, I'm, I'm very, and, and there's a number of ways I do that. I, um, I, I listen to, I'm an Apple Music guy, um, you know, some people are Spotify, whatever, but I, I do Apple Music. So discovering music through Apple Music. I always go early enough to catch the opening act when I go to a show. And I've discovered some amazing, amazing bands that have turned into some favorites just by by opening acts to show to bands that I'm going to, that I bought a ticket to go see. And I'll go there before the opening act goes on. I mean, I want to see their whole show. Um, and um, there's a couple of venues that I love so much that whenever I'm in a city, I'll go to the show at that venue, even if I don't know the band because I love the venue so much. So for example, in San Francisco, the Fillmore, what an amazing venue. Um, and near my mom's house in, in Connecticut is the Capitol Theater in Port Chester, New York. What an amazing venue. Red Rocks. Oh, my God. In outside of Denver. What an amazing venue. So if I find myself with a free evening and I'm near those sorts of places, I'll go. Even if I've never heard of the band, uh, I want to go because of the venue. And, so, and I've, I've actually discovered music that have be, become important to me just by doing that. Sounds amazing. Yeah, that Red Rock's one place that I haven't been to that I absolutely you got to get there. You, I got to get there. Yeah, got to get there. It's amazing. Well, David, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, thank you for taking the time. Appreciate it. As have I. Thanks very much. Hey, everyone. Guillermo here with an exciting addendum. After we finished recording my talk with David, he graciously volunteered to create a playlist for us. As he mentions in his interview, he's hesitant to put together these types of lists, mostly because his musical tastes are always changing, especially as he discovers new songs and artists. So please enjoy his playlist linked in the description below, but just keep in mind that this likely will not be the same list he'd give you the next time you speak with him. Again, for Fortivo Music Channel, I'm Guillermo, wishing you happy listening.